United Hour, your one-stop shop for all things Manchester United. I'm your host, Nick. And I'm Imran. Yeah, again, we're recording on an afternoon after a big match, a big win. We are celebrating our Carabao Cup win from yesterday. Uh, I was at the game. I know, Imran, you weren't. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you had probably have a better view of it than me. But it was so I was in a great part of the ground for the atmosphere, right behind the kind of United goal about row seven. But it's not always the best view of the pitch. And to be fair, yeah, I'd had quite a few drinks, so I was like more interested in the atmosphere than what was going on in the game after time as well. So yeah, I will be deferring to you for a lot of what was happening in this match. Um, but yeah, look, the celebrations, the feeling. It's all, yeah, it's been a while coming. It's the longest wait that we've had for a trophy since 1983. Six years uh, that went back from 97 to an 83 cup final win. So even in kind of, you know, years of the 80s and all, when we had not the best of times, we still were pulling out the odd cup here and there. So yeah, six years now finished back in there. And I've said before on this podcast that often we look down on this League Cup, but this time everybody's celebrating it a massive way, right? Well, yeah, it was. Well, actually, I think you find the League Cup is now the most important uh, domestic trophy because because we've won it. It, <laughs> it meant nothing when City won it five times or whatever, but now we've won it. Now it means something. And to be fair, actually, you, yeah, the way this final's been built up because of us, because of Newcastle, it feels like it has actually taken on way more importance. I feel maybe I just pay less attention to it when we're not in the final, but to me, it feels like this was a. It felt like a big final, a big game. And yeah, just to win it was, I mean, fantastic. The I'm giving you feelings you haven't had for a long, long time. Yeah, and it just shows how starved we've been of that kind of success. As a yeah, I, I'll be honest, I haven't watched recent Carabao Cup finals. If we, you know, when we're not in it, I'm not that interested. Um, but yeah, even just to get to the final, it's been a while. Of course, Ole did get us to the Europa League final. We didn't win it. But yeah, this one does have a different feel as well just off how things are going earlier in the season. And the players, the players seem to really enjoy it. You know, I said my view of the pitch and the on-field wasn't great, but I had a great view of all the celebrations being right there by pitch side, the players coming around after. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, let's have a quick look at that match. I mean, it was not a kind of classic performance, was it? Uh, no, but it, I felt like a game we also controlled. Hmm. Um, I didn't feel like we were ever in any real jeopardy. In fact, I felt we actually scored at a really good time because that felt when Newcastle were about to like peak in there, getting into the game. I think Maximan had that one shot a couple of minutes before and they just started to feel like they were really feeling themselves into the game. And then we scored and that kind of killed it. And then from then on, I felt like we were in total control. Yeah, in the second half, we kind of just played that counter-attacking, counter-pressing game, uh, inviting them onto us and controlling it in that aspect. But it didn't, it, it didn't really feel like Newcastle ever troubled De Gea or troubled our defence. And uh, I mean... You could pick a man of the match, I think, from Martinez, Varane, or Casemiro. I think all three, any three of them could have a man of the match. Probably Aaron Wan-Bissaka too for his half. But yeah, you didn't, it didn't feel like you were going to get past those three or past De Gea. And it turned out to be a quite a comfortable cup final, which is quite nice, really. No, yeah, and it was actually yeah more comfortable than I was expecting. Uh, as you said, there was that early kind of chance for St. Maximin, and after that, there wasn't a great deal. But yeah, it was a very different kind of performance than maybe we'd had against these couple against Barcelona recently, where I felt we really kind of went toe-to-toe with them, played some lovely passing moves, created good chances. This one, I mean, Eric Ten Hag, of course, he'd said pre-match that Newcastle are an annoying team. They come to defend. They maybe come to time waste. And yeah, there was a bit of mind games. He'd come in pre-match from this as well. So I think he knew that that first goal is absolutely vital. And that if Newcastle get it, and then try and just hmm. defend it, it's going to be a nightmare for us. So, yeah, it looked like he went a bit more kind of reserved, a bit more defensive himself than maybe he has done in other matches recently. And it shows a bit of that tactical flexibility, you know, that we were talking about in the last show, how he's happy to switch things up, even in the middle of a match, formations, players. Uh, and, yeah, I think he realised that, yeah, we're going to have to approach this one in a totally different way than when we're playing somebody like Barcelona. Yeah, because we said it on the last part, but going 1-0 down to Newcastle in a cup final, no less, would have been an absolute slog to get back into it. And it, it felt like actually we were, and plus they would have obviously, not that we weren't up for it, but you could say sense like Newcastle, their first final, and got most of the, I think most of their players' first finals, fans, they'd be right up for it from the off. And it was up to us to kind of take the sting out of the game a little bit, uh, slow it down, 
play at our own pace and then try to get a goal and catch them. And that's what we did. Um, yeah, because going a goal down would have been awful. And when we got the goal, then we can control it and uh, control the game, and we just sort it out. And then I think the second goal was a real boon. And then that <laughs> a two 0 at half time, you were thinking we we're in a great position here, and it would have been unlikely for us to lose it. I think at that point. Yeah, definitely, because we know that Newcastle is not their attacking side that is their strong point. It's definitely their defensive side. But yeah, we showed our defensive side in this game. Uh, you know, I've been really happy with a lot of our attacking play recently. But as you mentioned, the players that really come out of this match with credit is more about the defenders, about Varane, Martinez, Juan Bissaka, and yeah, Casemiro, deservedly man of the match and getting that opening goal. That's now like four goals for him in our last 12 games. And it equals, it took him like 100 matches to, to score four goals before that. Uh, Isn't it something five goals he's got this season? Is it? I, I no, yeah, this five. season. I said in the last yeah. 12 games. Oh, uh, in the last 12, yeah, yeah. Yeah, four goals in 12 games. So yeah, they've been coming like on quite a regular basis for him. Um, and yeah, I've never had him down as somebody who was going to be chipping in with this many goals. Well, if you look at it actually. If you look at Fred Casemiro and Ericsson, between them, they've got 30 goal contributions in terms of goals and assists. I think Casemiro's on about 10, Fred's on 9, and Ericsson's on 11 um, in terms of goals plus assists. So that's a lot from your midfield. And especially we've been, we're used to our midfield not really contributing anything in terms of goals and assists, and it kind of all falling on Bruno plus whoever's up front shoulders so it's actually pretty good that we have a midfield there I mean I obviously you expected Ericsson to chip in with the assists and actually maybe a few more goals than he's got but I don't think you would expect Casemiro to come up with five goals and five assists and Fred Fred's equaled his total for the all of last year uh all of last season already um and he's played a lot less this season obviously he's not been first choice whereas last season was pretty much first choice throughout so actually and he'll probably end up you can imagine him definitely getting a few more goals and assists for the end of the season so yeah, it's great. It's great contributions from them, and yet not what you expect from Casemiro. But he's adding all these strings to his game that we didn't know about because it's three of three of the Madrid shackles. Hmm. And yeah, it's great to see players like Varane, Casemiro, who's won everything. You know, World Cups, Champions League. Because I swear by yesterday's celebration, you think it was the first trophy they won. Them yeah, to. well, that's what I'm saying. They're absolutely loving it. Uh, and yeah, you know, even for these players who've been everywhere, going into a full Wembley Stadium representing your team, winning something is still something that they will remember. Uh, you know, I'm sure they, if they ask them, honestly, they won't compare it to when they've won things like the World Cups and Champions Leagues. And hopefully, yeah, we can get towards doing that in United colours for them. But yeah, they, you could see they were absolutely loving it and uh, enjoying every moment like us fans were. No, I mean, the celebrate. I've watched the celebrations back so many times, watched all the pictures. I mean, Val Vekhoff is my favourite because he was just loving life. He looked like the happiest man in the galaxy. And to be fair to him, he probably is because, what, three months ago, he's at the six. He's gone from being relegated with Burnley to playing for probably like the fourth best team in Turkey to suddenly he's playing for Man United, starting the cup final and winning the bloody thing, winning his first. He's played in two cup finals before this in Holland and lost both. And now he's starting up front, getting an assist and winning the cup final. Just him on his haunches, just looking at the crowd. It's That is, I mean... People will slate his, you know, footballing ability or whatever. But I mean, he can't fault his work rate. He can't fault the passion he had. He's had since coming here, and it's just made me really happy. No, and I have to give him some credit because you know we talked about who we would start in this game on the last podcast, and I said I would not start him because I just thought he was doing the hard work but not offering enough uh, in other places of pitch. But yeah, in the end, he's got the assist for the Rashford goal. Uh, and that goal has now officially been credited. Originally, it went down as an own goal, but it's now officially a Rashford goal. But yeah, the assist comes from Veghorst. Mm. I thought he had a decent game. Again, his stats defensively, even from playing number nine, are his best point in his game. If you look at how many tackles he's made, how many interceptions, uh, you know, it's all about the defensive side of it. But yeah, if he can do that in the match and it makes the difference, you can't complain. And as I say, adding an assist there as well, he was definitely worthy of getting the start. Yeah, I thought he had probably his best half of football for us and he saved it for the final and it's what you want, really. Uh, Great assist, a nice little play between him and Rashford who I think actually seemed to do all right together, him and Rashford. But um, but yeah, and then Rashford going good. Not the best of shots, but you get that look and Karius has gone down a bit, probably a bit too early. And I mean, not a massive error from from Karius. I thought he actually had a good game. Uh, Like the... The humanitarian in me was like quite happy that Carrius had a 
an okay game and we still won. I, I, I don't think I wanted the we won because Carrius did five howlers and I'm quite glad we won in, and he had a fine game. But yeah. And then once that goal goes in, you really think we're on it then. We completely missed out the first goal as well, though. Yeah, no, no, no let's talk about the goals. Uh, as you said, it, the game was pretty even early on. There wasn't a huge amount of open chances, I say, right in front of me. Because, yeah, Newcastle were attacking our end in the first half. There was that sent maximum chance. David De Gea makes a good save. But, yeah, it's kind of soonest after that that we take the lead. Uh, I wouldn't say it was like against the runner play. I thought it was like evenish early on. But yeah, making that breakthrough, getting the goal, and yeah, header, nice cross from Luke Shaw. It was just perfect timing at that kind of mm. point in the game. Just really made the whole difference. Well, the whole the whole thing was about perfect time. Perfect time to score, perfect cross from Luke Shaw, perfect time run from Casemiro, and I mean that's a great header. Newcastle really don't do anything that wrong with it either. You could probably say that their line's a bit high to be defending on the edge of the box from where the free kick was being delivered in. But not, not. I mean, you defend, teams defend that that way for crosses coming in from there all the time. It's just a fantastic delivery from Shaw and a brilliant header from Casemiro. I thought it was offside at first. I was thinking, oh my god, they're going to rule this out for offside. You can't really tell with all the, the legs blurring together. It's one of those where next year or however many years when they come for that automatic offside nonsense that it might be, or oh, his knee was a millimeter offside or whatever crap. But really, that's not offside. That's a great great header, and it, we hadn't ruled off for offside, it was a joke. So, yeah, glad it stood. Casemiro was amazing. He is amazing. He is... I mean, I, I, still, I still have to, you still have to scratch your head and wonder what he's doing here sometimes. Like, why, why has Casemiro decided to come to Man United? Who knows, but I'm, I'm really glad he has, because he is amazing. Well, look, Madrid deemed him surplus to requirements. They were ready for like the next generation and had bought in, you know, what they thought were players going to be going for a while. And yeah, their, their losses obviously are gain. I mean, it is said that Ancelotti did not want to lose Casemiro. And it was more down to the fact, you know, they'd paid a lot of money for uh, too many and um, Camavinga as well. Mm. So a lot of money they'd splashed out on what they see as the players that were going to be there for 10 years. So I guess they were ready to recoup some of some of the player who they think is coming to the end of his time. Uh, well, I think but you, yeah. can, you can tell he's really relishing being the main... He is the main man in our midfield, whereas obviously at Madrid he was... Not that he wasn't the main man, but he was deferring to Modric and Cruz, who are two incredible footballers. Modric, probably the greatest centre midfielder of his generation. So... But with us, he, he is the main man in that midfield. All goes through him. He is arguably our, either our top most important or second most important player. And he, I think he's relishing that. Um, you can no, tell I think he, he is how the he top most himself. important. There's only Rashford this season yeah, who can only be Rashford, argue yeah, with who could, yeah. And so he's, he's relishing in that. He's relishing being a leader and loving playing for United. I mean, the way he celebrated winning a goal kick was both hilarious and great to see. Um, so, yeah, he's... I mean, he is the standard, and he is the standard that he's setting, and we're, we're pushing off that. And did you see him as well having a go at Bruno, even though we were like two? I reckon that was a bit tongue in cheek. <laughs> but to be fair, San- Sancho was offside for that whole thing anyway, so I don't think Bruno could have passed it to him anyway, even if he wanted to. Sancho was offside for most of that run. Uh, it was a good save from Karras as well. And, you know, 2 0 up with 93rd minute, who cares if you score or don't score? Yeah, well, he obviously did care, but. <laughs> um... But no, look, let's go back to the second goal. Because I say, once we went up to then get that second goal before half time, really kind of killed this tie. And, and that's why I put this performance, I can say it's like it was an efficient performance. Mm. No, it wasn't like a stunning play, great football from us. Uh, and if we go and look at stats, you know, I'm always looking at like passing accuracy and things. And we were very low. I mean, I don't even want to say how low some players, even like Casemiro, uh, lower than I've ever seen him. But it's because a lot of this second half in particular was more about just stopping them from getting that goal rather than mm. for us going. And that's why, yeah, you see some of our players in the 50s. I mean, Walt Weghorst is in the 40s. And yeah, I, I've been watching, I watch passing accuracy stats for like literally seasons and you don't, I haven't seen Manchester United player as low as that, but what? he made up for it with an assist. He's made up for it with the amount of tackles he's pulling out. Uh, so yeah, there's two sides of the game, obviously. Yeah, well, it was a game where we, we, we tried to control it out of possession as opposed to in possession. Usually, mm. we tend to like to control the ball, control the possession, control the tempo of the game. But actually, this game, we, we ceded it to them and controlled it out of the game and let them play at their own pace. And then our idea was then, once we get the ball, try to get it forward as quickly as possible. 
Uh, you could see even in the second half, anytime someone got the ball, someone the ball broke to someone, instead of like putting a foot on it and calming things down, and I was I was crying out for us to calm things down. To be fair, the, the idea was get it forward quickly and let's catch them on the break and let's get this third goal. It wasn't about like calming it down, slowing the tempo down, controlling it because we we would we knew that Newcastle would just press us and then probably might maybe win the ball back in a dangerous position. So it was about getting it forward, and that was yeah we did high turnovers, but we also created probably the best chance in that second half really because of the breaks. Um, Bruno got in behind uh, Rashford nearly got in behind Sancho nearly got in behind so things were happening it, it was just yeah I can I can see the tactic from Ted Hag I can th- see his thinking as well um, putting it, kind of putting it all on Newcastle and then letting us defend it soak it up and then get them where it hurts it was a very professional I would go for professional performance I think in the cup final professional cup final performance yeah, professional, efficient. I mean, yeah, these are the kind of words you're going to use for it. And it is good to see us being able to win in different ways, being able to deal with different kinds of teams, different kinds of oppositions. Uh, and yeah, tactically, Ten Hag's obviously got it spot on again. He did against Barcelona in a completely different situation. And he has again just three days later against Newcastle United. I mean, like you say, Newcastle United don't want to be in control of the game. They don't mm. want to be the ones who are having the most possession. And that's the way this game has gone. And it's worked out for as well. Uh, I mean, on XG, the game is kind of damn even. It's like basically 1.2 for both teams. So yeah, it shows around that. So maybe saying that we are slightly lucky to get two goals out of this game. Um, but I say XG on these kind of games where one team goes 2-0 up and then changes their style, I think doesn't necessarily reflect how the game actually runs through. And, uh, you know, like you said earlier, I thought we were in control of this game for most of the way. There wasn't any black point got worried about it i mean newcastle did have a lot more possession and the odd kind of chances second half but yeah mm. nothing that felt that threatening at any point yeah and ten Hag got his substitution spot on basically all game uh, he's been getting his substitution spot on for the last two months or so actually we, we commented this on the last pod actually how great his substitution has been but this game i mean bringing one on at half time for dallo who had a yellow card and had to deal with said maximum and you got one just locked down his side it's one of the best 45 minutes performance that I can recall from one of our players. I thought it was absolutely sensational. He literally put himself in running for man of the match after 45 minutes. He was that good. And we know wan is a world-class tackler. Like, he is... And for all the stick I gave wan for his footballing ability, you cannot doubt him as a one-on-one defender. And he just took Maxman completely out of the game and actually did contribute going forward as well. Won the ball quite hard the pitch a couple of times. Uh, had a, I think he had even two shots, which is kind of crazy. Um... Then once we once we had that foothold and then Newcastle started playing more in the middle, we started losing control in the middle, he brought on Spitzer and McTominay and then suddenly we seeded back the ball. We, we, that's when, again, we got more control in the game and created a few chances after that because Newcastle couldn't play through the middle because we had Spitzer and McTominay running around like crazy people. So great substitutions from um, Ten Hag and it, yeah, it always changing the game into our favour. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, Aaron Wan-Bissaka made seven tackles in this game, even though he only played half the match, which is the most of anyone on the pitch and the most that anyone's managed in a final for several years, even though he only played half of it. Um, you know, there was a big change at half time as well because Newcastle bring on Alexander Izak. So mm. they've thrown on another forward. So they went straight for it. Uh, and yeah, it was an interesting change. You know, there's been a lot of chat recently about Dallow versus Aaron Wan-Bissaka. I mean, Generally, I think people will say Dallow's probably supposed to be the more technical, uh, bit better on the ball, better going forward, whereas Juan Bissaka is the rock solid at the back. Great tackling. I mean, is there anyone better, like one-on-one in football? Probably not. I don't think it's his, it's his world-class attribute. And it's it's good to have two right-backs who have completely different size for them. If you if you have a game where you're going to have all the possession, then you put Dallow in. If, you go, if we're playing PSG tomorrow and Mbappe's on that side, put Juan Bissaka in, so... It's good to have two right backs, and actually, I mean, I've been crying. I was, I mean, I have to apologise to him. Like, I've been crying out for us to get rid of him and get a new right back in for God knows how long. And it actually, turns out the next season, this summer, maybe actually, we don't need a new right back at all if Ten Hag continues to to work his miracles. Um, and one sacker, actually, I mean, even that, that game against City where he suddenly turned into um, Zinedine Zidane for like ten minutes and was becomes the world best dribbler. If you can sort that side of his game out, and I, under Ten Hag, who knows what's possible? Then yeah. Right back is not something we have to be concerned about. No, yeah. I mean, uh, after striker, I think before when we were talking about transfer windows, we had right back maybe next on the list. 
Mm. Uh, but at the moment, I don't think we even need to look at that. I think the two of them can quite happily rotate when needed. They both they offer something a little bit different. But yeah, they're both playing at a very high level. I mean, some people already forget that in that first part of our season up to the World Cup, uh, Diogo Dallo was definitely up for our player up to that point of the season. He was playing absolutely outstanding and playing every single game. Zaren Wan-Bissaka had been injured and was not available. Since then, Dallo got injured, Wan-Bissaka's played a lot. And now it's a great part where they can both come in interchange as needed. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, it's um, funny you say that. I mean, there's... I was thinking actually yesterday, who would you give our player of the season to? There's so many contenders for our player of the season now. I think on any given other year, Varane, Martinez, Shaw, Casemiro, Rashford would be hands down our player of the season, but because they're all there together doing it at the same time. Even Bruno recently has been fantastic. I probably wouldn't put him up there with those five, but you could. And I, I don't know who wins our player of the season. Probably Casemiro or Rashford, probably. But I mean, yeah, actually, me, maybe Martinez. I mean, it's well. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do it. Yeah, yeah. Look, they have so many options. I mean, I know. I think we tried to do player of the season last season, and we couldn't really come up with anybody we wanted to give it to. So, yeah, a big change around there. Uh, we will take a quick break there. Come back and talk about the rest of that match and what's going on ahead. Back for the second half of the show. And yeah, we were talking about the substitutions. We were talking about Aaron Wambasaka coming on and putting in an absolute shift in the second half. Um, I think, again, Ten Hag saw how this game was going and then did make quite a shift around. It was the 70th minute. and You mentioned it already. Sabitza and McTominay come in, taking out Fred. And I think part of that will have been the fact that Fred was on a yellow card and mm-hmm. then also taking out Walt Weghorst. So yeah, quite a shift around then, standing Rashford up front going just for those long balls and hoping he can get on the end of them. But yeah, look, it kept Newcastle very, very busy. They then, you know, did make a couple of subs themselves, but showed the difference maybe in level where they were bringing on the likes of Murphy and Willock. They're Mm. not players that necessarily worry you that much. Although uh, it was quite a crazy shot from one of them, wasn't there? I mean, was it Jacob Murphy putting one of the most ridiculous shots you'll see for quite some time? Bent one way, then the other. And I thought, I, with the way the hair reacted, I was like, that's even miles away or really close. And then I saw the swerve on it. It's like, flipping neck. That, that would have been some goal. But yeah, to be fair, as soon as Maximan and Bruno Gimaresh are going off the pitch, you think, we've got this now. Without them two, you can't see Newcastle doing anything. And uh, I actually thought Bruno Gimaresh had a, a decent game um, for them in the wars a bit, but he, he had a good game. But yeah, once, once they're off the pitch, they're... they're their strength in depth is probably what's going to see them not qualify for Champions League this year. Um, obviously, it'll come in time when they're spending that money, but yeah, that's probably what that that's a big failure. There's and I mean, I do I do like Callum Wilson. I think he's a, a decent striker, but he's not a top level striker, and, and they probably need to sort that out as well. Well, they paid a lot of money for Isaac. Uh, mm. I think there's a, there is a big problem about strikers. Everybody needs a striker. I mean, we need a striker. Arsenal at the moment are somehow top of the league with Eddie Nketiah and playing up front week in, week out. I mean, there is definitely a dearth of top, top strikers out there. I mean, yeah, this will be something we'll talk about more in the summertime, obviously. But yeah, I do think the art of striker maybe is dying a bit. And yeah, we have, like I say, we're going to do that job for us at the moment. And in this match, he was very much playing number nine rather than number 10 that he has played sometimes. I mean, that was Mm. one thing I was kind of happy with in the lineup was that everybody was playing in what I think is their best position. Bruno back at 10. Anthony gives that balance on the right, Rashford on the left. Um, for me, those are the best positions where everybody should be playing in what I would call our kind of first eleven. Just a shame that we don't have Anthony Martial ever available uh, to play over there. I don't know if you saw that picture that Anthony with the, Martial... With the medical staff. Yeah, he put out a picture of himself celebrating with the cup and the, all the medical staff, who I guess are his kind of team at the moment. He's spending more time with them than he is with the rest of the players. Uh, but no, again, like going to like the post-match celebrations, it was great to see a lot of other players involved. I mean, I don't know if this was all shown on the telly or what, as I said. A lot of the celebrations were going on right in front of us and I stayed for quite a while uh, post-match and loads of fans did. Uh, you know, back in the days as well, when we were spoiled, I can remember winning these cups and leaving and saying, oh, I can't even be bothered to watch the trophy celebration. I've seen us win like eight of these before. 
uh, I'm going to get on the tube early. But uh, this time we stayed there celebrating, singing the whole way, singing as well down Wembley Way back to the tube. But yeah, there was players as well in the end on the back of the pitch, like Brandon Williams, Zidane Iqbal, mm. who were not even on the bench, not even, you know, around there. But they were on the pitch, Gret con- being part of the celebrations, congratulating all the players. Uh, there was also a picture where I think Marcus Rashford, and Scott McTominay, pulled out a lot of the other academy players and had a picture with the cop with, like I say, the Rikes of Williams, Iqbal, there's a few other of the youngsters who were there just to enjoy the ride. So it's great to see that kind of thing. Players who are not even part of it, still loving the fact that we're mm. back winning and feeling part of what might, might happen going forward with Manchester United now. Yeah, even Ericsson was on the pitch with his uh, leg in a boot, protective boot. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was uh, you've got to get everyone involved in these things, even if they're not part of the quote-unquote first team squad. It's all big team effort. So... Good to see, and um, I even I was quite happy. Well, I actually was very happy that Ten Hag put on Maguire as well. I thought it was a classy move from Ten Hag. Didn't did something he didn't have to do. Didn't have to bring on Maguire. We didn't need him really for the last five minutes, but he did it. Maguire's on the pitch. He's our captain. I thought it was great of the team to push him forward to the front to collect the trophy. And I thought it was great of Maguire to say, "Actually, Bruno, come and we'll do it together." And that's just the spirit of the team. That's how t- together the team are. I I, I thought it was great. And people saying, oh, why is Maguire doing it? He's the club captain at the end of the day. Like He's day in, day out, the club captain, doing all stuff behind the scenes. It's not just on the pitch stuff. He's doing stuff behind the scenes. And he has conducted himself as well as you could hope for someone who's the club captain but out of the team this year, saying all the right things, getting involved in celebrations. And yeah, he fully deserved to be up there lifting the trophy with Bruno. Ultimately, he has, played, he has been a big part of this campaign. He's played... A fair few games, captain team twice. I think Bruno's captain the team four times, including the final. So yeah, he's he's been part of the campaign. So yeah, get get him up there, get him lifting the trophy. Oh yeah, I was happy to see him getting involved in it. And I said I have seen some negative comments from some of our fans saying, "Oh, what are we bringing him on for? We don't want to see him." But you say at the moment, officially, he is the club captain, and he's got on with things in a professional way. He's not made a fuss about his lack of minutes. Let's see what happens in the summer. I mean, I'm not sure if a player like that, who is a regular for England, will be happy to be a substitute. And I would actually be surprised if he didn't look to move on in the summer. Yeah, uh, I think he'll move on, but I don't think he'll say anything bad. I don't. I can't see him no. saying anything negative about Ten Hag, about the club. I think he's loved his time at the club. Um, just these things happen. He's, we're moving on in a different direction. He's not part of that vision. See him moving on, it's probably best for the club as well, because we can actually get some money from him. We could probably get 30, 40 million from him, and that's a good bit of business. And... He'll be a good centre back for another Premier League team if he goes to like I don't know Newcastle or Villa. He'll be solid for them. So yeah, I think it'll, I'm, I'm just glad. You know, it's good winning trophies under his captaincy reign. He got to win a trophy, and that's great. Yeah, yeah. Look, I love it, this it, team. I love this team. I love all of them. So not yeah, in the moment great. anyone lifts the trophy. Well, look, at the they're end all of the day. doing their bits, and it, it did have a bit of kind of the feeling of passing the baton from Maguire to Bruno that probably mm. Bruno is going to be our long-term captain. I mean, do you remember when uh, Brian Robson kind of stayed around for that Premier League win? He didn't play much that season, uh, our first Premier League win. He played, I think he had like 10 substitute appearances or something like that. But he was there to lift that trophy and kind of pass on to the next generation. And I think he kind of held it up with Steve Bruce that season over there. And it had that kind of feel to it that, all right, he's he's coming out just to pick up the trophy. But yeah, he'll probably be moving on this summer. Um, but yeah, everybody was doing their bit. And as I said, the fans, it was a great day out. Uh, I mean, I was actually a bit worried leading up to this game because Newcastle fans were everywhere in London. Uh, everywhere, everywhere. I mean, they treated this like it was a Euro away. Some of them had showed up on Friday. I mean, there was videos and all going out on Trafalgar Square, absolutely packed with them. Uh, so I was a bit worried that United fans were going to be outnumbered, which is rare. Because normally, wherever we go, we're in the majority, as the most of our fans are everywhere. And uh, even like the day before on the Saturday, I'd played football Saturday morning, gone in my local pub. There was already Newcastle fans drinking in London. And I was like reminding them, you know, the match is tomorrow. They were in full kits on Saturday morning. And I don't even live that anywhere near Wembley. I'm southeast London. And I was like, you know, the match is tomorrow, boys. And they were just like, they were all good natured, though. That's the good thing. Between Manchester United and Newcastle United, there was a lot of mixing of fans, a lot of banter on the tube and stuff in and out, but all good natured. Everybody having a good chat, even post match, uh, you know, having a drink afterwards. And yeah, seeing quite a lot of Newcastle fans. There wasn't any animosity as you sometimes can get when one team are quite annoyed. I mean, I think they were happy 
just to be back in a final for the first time after a long time. And obviously, yeah, they're hoping for better things going forward as maybe they're expecting a bit more investment in the squad and things like that. I mean, you said you think they're not going to make top four now after this. You think this is going to maybe see the start of them falling off? I mean, already their form has been definitely falling off in the last month or so. I think so. I, don't, I just don't think they have the, the quality needed, especially within the squad. And they draw a lot of games. Even when they were in third, they were drawing a lot of games. I think, um, I think yeah, I think Spurs are... Hopefully not, but maybe Liverpool might just sneak in ahead of them. Um, I think we're sorted, though, and that's the main thing. Uh, just to go back to something I said, it's funny you mentioned Steve Bruce. I, it, it reminded me of actually 96 Steve Bruce, where we won the title in 96. He lifted the Premier League. And when we won the FA Cup a few days later, he told Eric Cantona to go lift that trophy, like passing the bat on there. So these things happen in cycles, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There is <clears throat> memories of that and, but it is, has, was always important for Fergie that he kept those experienced players in there just for the next lot to go through. Uh, and Ten Hag did mention this post-match about how our winners, because De Gea is our kind of last one now who's staying from teams who've won the Premier League. Mm. And, you know, he is the only representative. All right, Phil Jones is still officially a Manchester United player and he's still around there somewhere. And uh, I understand actually he was doing some of like punditry for this game. I didn't see any of that. So I wasn't no. watching it on telly. What? I think um, I think from the first team from the first eleven though I think only Rashford Shaw and De Gea have actually won a trophy with us I think from uh, the first yeah, eleven yeah so. well Martial as well but you know, he wasn't no he won in the first eleven though was he no you mean from yesterday yeah <laughs> from yeah, yesterday yeah. yeah so obviously like Jones has won stuff with us as well but like so yeah it's um good to get the winning feeling in the team um and it does feel, it does feel like it's the the gateway to 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 other bigger trophies and that's what I think what's the exciting thing about it it feels like it's the start of something not just well this is this is the best we can get even under Mourinho like we were winning the we won, won the league cup the well, FA that cup is the question the... you know that is the question that okay we've had a bad decade since Ferguson but we have still won things you know Louis van Hal won the FA cup uh Jose Mourinho won this league cup and the Europa League Ole got us to second place in a Europa League final so it's not been all bad but does this have a different feel to it. I mean, you know, as I said, we did win mm. trophies. I actually remember, unfortunately, winning the FA Cup, being in the queue to get on the tube after Wembley and already hearing that Louis van Gaal has basically been fired. So, yeah, that was definitely a different feeling at that yeah. time. I think that, well, at the other time, especially, that felt like the best this team could do was that FA Cup, and that's why it was quite a celebration because it felt like this is the peak of that team. Under Mourinho, yeah, we won three trophies, but again, it never felt like, well, we'll definitely now push on and I mean, maybe it did at the time. It's hard to look back now, but it never felt like... It just, I, for some reason, it's the, the, the optimism around the club, the quality of players we've got in, the fact that it definitely doesn't feel like we're that far away from City. We've just beaten Barcelona, who are, well, currently the best team in the league. I'd probably say Madrid are still better than them. Um, but yeah, it feels like... I mean, if we played Madrid this week, you would expect us to go to them in a much better way than Liverpool did. We might lose, but it'd be certainly closer. I... You put this team up against anyone now, and you wouldn't you wouldn't fear we'd get a, a hiding. Um, so it does feel different. It feels like it's not the first trophy of the season, and I mean the only way is up from here, really. Yeah, and I think as well. All right, not necessarily in this game, as we said, it was a more kind of professional, efficient performance. But generally, we've seen some very good football being played in this team, and I think that is a major difference, perhaps, than when we want things under Mourinho and maybe under Van Hal as well. I mean, Van mm. Hal, you know, was famous for having too much focus on possession style, not that many chances, not that many goals. Mourinho, of course, used to like to go ahead in game, start parking the bus. Under Ole as well, we won a lot of games, sometimes played some good football, played some nice goals in there as well, but it wasn't always consistent and maybe it was built around more the defensive side than the attacking side. Whereas, you know, we've seen us recently play teams like Manchester City, like Barcelona. We haven't just won those games by defending and going on the break. We won them by really going out and trying to match them. Yeah, it felt actually, although to be fair, it's funny you said it, it did feel like a lot like the Ajax final from the Europa League. It felt very similar kind of game in that we won 2-0, we controlled the whole thing and never really in doubt. Uh, But yeah, we do play a lot better football now. Um, We've seen it in those two games against Barcelona. Uh, We can create... Um, and I said the quality of player is just it's just there. We have the best centre back partnership in the league for my money. We've got the best defensive midfielder in the league. We've got the best left winger in the league. 
We've got Bruno Fernandes, one of the best attacking midfielders around. Like we've got all these players. We've got Luke Shaw's best left back in the world for my money. So we've got all these quality players, and it can only get better, you'd think. So so yeah, it, it definitely feels like the start. Yeah, and I think that's the thing as well. That it's so early on in Ten Hag's career. Um, you know, there was a lot of question marks over him coming from the Dutch league where sometimes people say, all right, yeah, you've won with Ajax, but it's a whole different scenario coming and winning anything uh, in the UK. And he, he has actually become the first Dutch manager ever to win the League Cup. Another extra little stat out there. I mean, I uh, don't know how many Dutch managers have ever had the chance to. I guess Louis van Gaal did win the FA Cup with us. Maybe Rude Hollett reached finals, and things like that. But yeah, off the top of my head. But yeah, random stats like that coming out. The other one, actually, uh, David De Gea yesterday became our all-time record holder on clean sheets, going one ahead of Peter Schmeichel on 181 clean sheets, Schmeichel 180, and in third place, Alex Stepney at 175. Uh, You know, I think most of us last season were saying that goalkeeper is a position that we need to change, that we need a new goalie. You know, we talked about right back before, and we all had question marks over that. Uh, But say De Gea's had a great season again it looks like going back three or four years doesn't it yeah um a couple of minor ricks here and there but i think all keepers do that but ultimately with his shot when when his shot stopping remains as good as it can be like it was in the first half against leicester um then i'm perfectly happy having De Gea in there and he is trying <laughs> to expand his game he sweeps now there was that one bit yeah the, the, my favorite bit of yesterday actually was when trippier got him down the right he was offside in the end but actually i thought he might have been on he might have gone to VAR. And then De Gea's position on that was very adventurous, up near his 60-yard line, and then he's cutting out that cross because Boyce Wilson has a tapping, and that's different kind of keeping that we normally see from De Gea. We don't normally see that sort of thing. And uh, listen, I you watch the Chelsea-Tottenham game yesterday, you watch Kepa flap at one that's going in over his head, and you think De Gea saves that 99 times out of 100. And you think maybe actually shot-stopping, for me, is always going to be the number one priority. I would not, I mean... What, Edison's the best keeper in the league with his feet? I want to swap to here for Edison because I think Edison's pretty rubbish at shot stopping. And for me, I would rather take shot stopping first. And I think he'd probably throw Ten Hag, he'd take shot stopping first. Obviously, like Allison's the the best of both worlds, but you know, we are not gonna get Allison anytime soon. And yeah, there's probably keepers out there we can get. But I think while De Gea is here, while he's a club legend, while he's winning things with the club, I think Ten Hag's gonna be very happy with him as long as he can negotiate his contract down. And yeah, I think De Gea has improved this season for sure with his distribution. He has also improved coming out and claiming balls. So I think he has tried to focus on what we saw as deficiencies. And I didn't think that at this point in his career, at this age, that he could still improve. So yeah, it's great to see. You know, again and again, we're seeing Ten Hag and his coaching staff improving players at every part of the pitch, whether it's De Gea, whether it's Juan Bissaka, Marcus Rashford, you know, the rejuvenation of uh, Jaden Sancho as well after being out. So, yeah, all over the pitch, we're seeing players. I, I'm improving. not sure if Jaden Sancho has been rejuvenated, by the way. I think there's a lot of talk about rejuvenated Jaden Sancho. I think he's just the same fairly average player, but he's a bit happier now. Well, I'd say, like, rejuvenated from not being part of the squad <laughs> not, that he's not, actually playing. From not playing now. at all <laughs> to, to, to playing. I think he's somewhat yeah, average. Look, he has had a couple of goals decent, as well. I mean, he has had yeah, a couple of goals. Sometimes he's, sometimes he's decent. In. Sometimes he's average. Sometimes he's poor. That's kind of that's kind of the Jaden Sancho thing. But hey, he's happy now, so that's fine. Yeah, just that he's actually involved. As I say, he scored a couple of goals since he's been back in. Uh, you know, that's a long way from he played a lot of matches not playing very well before that. And yeah, as we know, he'd been not even part of the squad recently. So yeah, hmm. I, I know there is a long way for him to go to like justify the kind of amount of money we've paid for him. But he is still only 22 years old. And I think, yeah, another kind of half year under Ten Hag, we'll see what Jadon Sancho can really do. Um, But, yeah, go from there. But, yeah, look, I I, I absolutely love this uh, day over there. We are...